Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Karamat Ali, who is a human rights activist in Pakistan and has been taking up a number of issues for a very long time. Karamat, good to have you back with us. Thank you. Karamat, recently, of course, the Malala shooting is in the news all over the world. Do you think it has made a difference to Pakistan the way people have reacted to this particular shooting of a 15-year-old girl? Yeah, definitely. You see, even before this incident, uh, she has been traveling in different parts of Pakistan and she's quite a remarkable uh, child, uh, very, very aware of what is happening and very progressive thinking person. So she was making an impact already. A number of schools had been named after her. She was invited to all the major cities. Like in Karachi, whenever she came, she stayed with us. Her father is a very good friend. So very sort of extraordinary kind of child. And uh, obviously she was not afraid of threats which she was getting. And, you know, like in the beginning of last month, uh, uh, we used to kind of communicate quite regularly. So she called to say, uncle, come, this is all fine now, there's no problem, <laughs> no, no security issues, I go to school on my own, so no problem. So she had inspired quite a lot of people already. And she had become a very well-known figure. Iconic figure yeah. for... The right of the girl child exactly. to study. Exactly. And to stand up to these people who were extremely brutal and, uh, you know, what they did when they took over Swat was very well known. So, under such conditions, uh, a young girl standing up to them, speaking out, writing a diary, that has already, it had made a big sort of impact. So, the attack on her really triggered something across uh, the whole country, regardless of where you come from, which class you belong to. So th this was something, I mean, I have only known this in my own experience. I mean, I don't believe in war, so I will not refer to people uniting during the time of a silly war. But in during the 1968-69 movement, against uh, Ayub Khan's dictatorship. That was one time when we saw people kind of coming out, speaking out, getting together and really, you know, breaking all the <coughs> kind of, you know, the fear that was imposed upon people. So this is what I have seen this time because Taliban had also been able to, in a way, instill a lot of fear amongst people because one, their brutality, but their outreach had become uh, quite extraordinary. They were attacking, I mean, you can imagine they attacked the GHQ, they went and attacked this air base, and they went and attacked this naval base, and then they were attacking people who they don't like at will. So that was some kind of a, an atmosphere of <coughs> complete fear where people were not challenging them. And the governor. They, they were gradually expanding their sphere of influence. Like even in a, the city like Karachi, we know areas now where we are told Taliban, they set up their own courts uh, and they were administering sentences that they gave to people and they extorted money and whatever. So I think this incident really triggered something extraordinary. And uh, hopefully that can be sustained and there is a counter-offensive at the political, ideological level against such forces. You know, we had the Salman Taseer's killing and then you had the issue that the judge who sentenced the killer had to leave the country. Do you think that this kind of things would change with uh, the Malala uh, attack? I'm sure, I'm sure. I think it has already started that process because I'm sure you know you know about this killer of Salman Tasi. Suddenly there were demonstrations in Pakistan by some forces who were demanding his release. And we also know that Salman Tasi's son had been 
abducted and uh, is in, in, in the custody of such people who want to bargain. He's still uh, alive. He's still alive. He had been in touch with the family. So all such forces have been put in a defensive position. Now the thing is, you know, like as far as ordinary people are concerned, they, they have shown their disapproval, disgust with such elements. The state has to take a decisive action against these people. And unfortunately, because in, in Pakistani politics, there are a number of mainstream political parties who, who have a soft corner or even more than that, uh, links with the Taliban. And they want to see consensus being built before any action can be taken. So I feel the state has to really act now and take uh, action against them. You don't create consensus around people who are murderers, who are killers, who they must be punished. And uh, the law does not uh, ask for any consensus. I mean, there is already a consensus. Karabat, the real issue has always been that a section of the Pakistani state and the military establish establishment has seen in these forces a kind of strategic depth in Afghanistan, and possibly also in India vis-a-vis -vis what is being thought of in Kashmir. So do you think that this section of the Pakistani state which has been implicated, at least by a lot of people, in these kind of forces that you are talking about, that this section of the Pakistani state would rethink, would be isolated, could be controlled, could be changed? Yeah, I'm sure. I think. Uh one, you know, if you look at uh, the incidents that I mentioned where uh, some of the bastions of the military power of the state had been attacked in broad daylight in the most blatant manner. So I think that should also teach something to those sections who had soft kind of corners for these people. But, you know, al along with the, the brutality of the Taliban and the need to counter them, this whole notion of strategic depth or this whole notion of kind of, a, you know, a particular perspective on what is defense and how we deal with our neighbors, all that has come under very, very uh, detailed discussion now. And uh, even, even today's paper I was reading, you know, at least two people writing about the, the foolishness of this notion of Afghanistan being the area of strategic depth. So somebody has written, no, it's not Afghanistan. Our strategic depth lies in Balochistan. So if we are alienating Balochistan, we, we should forget about uh, the strategic. <laughs> and why do we need that depth? Why, we, why can't we go for a peaceful coexistence with our neighbors and sort out our issues? develop more cooperation, more trade, so that will ensure. Well, the question of strategic depth is really almost a 19th century concept where you think of other countries as your strategic depth. Today's world, you really think about softer borders, more, you know, cooperation between exactly. countries, exactly. less militarization as really exactly. the way to... And also this strategic depth thing, you know, it implies that first of all you will make a retreat. Absolutely. And then you find a place to go to. But why get yourself in such a position? Why go to war in the first place? Why not find peaceful solution? And I think that is really, in, in a way, if you look at the recent development of uh, dialogue between India and Pakistan, you already see some very basic changes taking place on the, the issue of trade, for example. You know, uh, Pakistan has now agreed to grant MFN status to India and by December this process will be complete. And if you remember initially there was this whole, this group of people, political parties and these so-called, you know, jihadis and the religious parties, they came together under this umbrella organization called Defense of Pakistan Council. And their main plank was, we will not allow 
Pakistan to accord the MFN status to India because India is our eternal enemy, etc. They were wall choking all over Pakistan. But once this agreement was formalized, they haven't been able to organize a single rally. So it shows a lot to me as to what is going on uh, in front of us and behind the scenes, uh, especially among those forces who had a particular view of uh, themselves, of India, of uh, security. Uh, I think international situation, the, our economic circumstances, they are forcing everybody to rethink. And that sense we are moving uh, in the right direction. So I think all these things put together create a great opportunity for all those who want peace, who want progress for ordinary people uh, to come together and really give it a big push. And uh, So Karabat, you think that the Malala shooting, however unfortunate obviously it is for Malala and the fact that she's been shot in the head and is still in a critical condition though improving also brings about a situation where there is a possibility of bringing peace the agenda of peace to the forefront oh sure definitely definitely because you know this one incident has really really in a way sort of woken up people because for many people living in Karachi, you know, like in defense uh, housing society or wherever, they thought all this is like far away from us. And suddenly people are saying, no, I mean, you know, you saw that uh, headband with I am Malala. Now, these are uh, women coming out of the upper class household. You know, they, they were not part of the labor movement or anything. So I think that really... Touched a deep chord yeah, in the people exactly. of Pakistan. And you the know, fact is, that this was a, a child was a girl, because, you know, in, in Pakistani society, it's very important that women who are seen to be inferior, and there is a person who has really demonstrated something completely different. This is obviously touched, as you were saying, a deep chord. But, you know, in, pa in India, for instance, there is not that understanding of Pakistan. And a lot of people say, yeah, okay, this will happen for 15 days, 20 days, but it will be business as usual. This you don't think is so, and there is a really a qualitative shift because of one incident. And sometimes history moves through incidents of this kind. So you think this is really historical movement. I think it is. You know, like uh, we, we keep uh, talking about defining moments, defining moments. I think we don't have many defining moments in our history. <laughs> We have them rarely, so... We have the defining moments which have gone the other way. Exactly. But this is, to me, a defining moment, really, in the sense that it has raised... I mean, you see, you, you, you can see people resisting dictatorship, you can see people opposing one view or the other, but not necessarily questioning the political, ideological basis of what policies in Pakistan or whether in the name of uh, defense or economic development or integrity of the state. So all that, you know, begins to be challenged and uh, that to me is very, very important. I'm not saying this will be an automatic process and will lead to changes. It will need, obviously, very, very well thought out, organized, political, ideological, action to mobilizational activities. Because uh, as you, you know, um, you said very rightly, you know, uh, within the state structures, such elements have had, you know, they have made deep penetration. And it's not so easy to dislodge them. But the process has started. has started. And that's very important. And the process has started at a mass level. You know, Karabat, that also brings me to another important question. It's always easier to fight the state because people have known historically how to fight the state. They have come onto the streets, they demonstrate, and we have seen even in Egypt, such a powerful state actually breaking up in front of the opposition by the people. When it comes to armed groups, which are already a part of society, it's the fear psychosis that's really much more difficult to break. 
Do you think in that sense this is a unique issue of how to confront the fear psychosis of in which the armed militants are already a part of your society? You see, uh, when, when this happened and, uh, pe you know, people started calling for demonstration, then we all went to demonstrate. Uh, there was this sort of on the back of one's mind to be careful because there was the likelihood of these people attacking such demonstrations. But two things. One was that you had to be careful and mindful of all that. But the fact that they did not dare attack anywhere, uh, up till now, uh, and they were the demonstrators were mostly women. In all the big cities, they were mostly women, young women who came out. So one, that fear was not there. Second, they also they were put in a defensive position by doing this. They did not expect this kind of a reaction. So I think both these development give a lot of optimism that you can actually translate this opportunity into a movement against extremism and fundamentalism and the militarism that has prevailed all these years in every sphere of life in Pakistan. Karabat, if this is a defining moment in Pakistan, how do you think the civil society, the political forces in India must react in order to make this happen in Pakistan because the dynamics of Pakistan and India have been has a resonance with each other or a dissonance with each other if you will. Sure. No, I, I, I really I will go even further. I think it is whatever happens in Pakistan unless people of India and Pakistan do not get together and deal with these issues as common issues. Uh, we will not be able to really succeed in Pakistan on our own because, as you know, the forces that are inimical to any democratic, peaceful development are much stronger there. And they always use India as an excuse to further expand their influence and power. So if there is, for example, you said, you know, people are thinking maybe it will <laughs> run for another two weeks. No, it should not be allowed to run out like that. There should be demonstrations there and I'm, I'm glad that I have seen very good coverage in the Indian press. People have come out, uh, people have, uh, you know, expressed their disgust at what has happened. But a lot more needs to be done. I think there should be uh, a sort of... A, a more sort of open uh, demonstration of solidarity, communication with people who are taking up those issues there, and also on the part of Indian states to, to express their resolve that we, we should fight this together. I mean, after all, within the SARC process, we have a convention on combating terrorism, and it is there since 1987. This incident should actually, you know, motivate us to put together that joint mechanism to combat terrorism and uh, to, you know, to kind of unite our resolve and forces to do that and send a very strong message to, to these elements that they are not confronting the Pakistani people and the state alone, but this is a regional issue and uh, people in the region and the states in the region will come together to, to get rid of them. Karabat, as you know, the problem of the two states is the minute you get their agencies into one room, there is a Pavlovian reflex by which they start blaming each other. So I think the real issue is how the society at large can take the initiative outside as well, so that this pressure on the state agencies are more, sure. and they don't think that this is business as usual. Exactly. No, that's what I'm saying. It, the initiative has to come from the people. But I'm saying there is a, an obligation uh, of the state institutions as well. Once you, you know, if you are part of a, an arrangement, which is SARC, you have signed a charter, meaning you have committed yourself, yourself to certain things. And you, you have uh, worked out this convention together, so there is an obligation. So that in that context, I'm saying the state has have the basis to, to intervene in such situation. Intervening not the way they have been intervening up till now, 
but in a more positive sense to curb this phenomenon. So what you're really saying is that on both sides you should build pressure on the states, the state missionaries to really do what they have signed up to do, which they haven't done till now. Exactly, exactly. I think that's very important. And unfortunately, up till now, people in India and Pakistan and in other South Asian countries, we have not really seriously looked at all these developments. We have really ignored them. And there have been sub substantial developments, you know, in terms of commitments, in terms, I mean, you have set up a development fund together, you're talking about a food bank, you're talking, now activate them. This sense of being South Asians need to be really enhanced at this particular moment. And so that these elements, whether they are extremist of the Muslim brand or Hindu brand or whatever, or a Buddhist brand in Sri Lanka, they can be isolated by South Asians together as a united force. And uh, I think this, these kind of uh, incidents, they do provide us with such possibilities. Historical windows of opportunity exactly. which must be seized. Must be seized. Mixing my metaphors. <laughs> yeah, <Thank>. sure. <laughs> Thank you, Karabat. Thank you.